When making a video game, it's always fun to fantasize what the boss battles are going to be. I mean, they're literally defined as significant opponents and are often the most memorable parts of a game. You can call me an artist, and I'm trying to make my own creature collector based off of STEM topics. Should I be thinking about bosses this early on in the project? Probably not, but I do have a line of designs that I would consider to be a possible boss encounter. However, before I share that, how does a boss of the creature collector genre handle boss battles? Pokemon, do they even have boss battles? Turns out, they come in many forms. So strap in as we try to answer what boss battles are like in Pokemon. Many boss battles have the same or at least similar gameplay to the rest of the game. Because, in a way, these kinds of boss battles are tests to demonstrate your mastery. In Pokemon, most of the time you're playing the same turn-based role player. But there's a subtle difference that calls for different designs. One is a singular encounter against the weird creature, and the other is a whole team of them, naturally being the harder encounter. So when I tell you to name me a boss battle in Pokemon, it's usually a variant of the trainer battle. So we'll start with the trainer battle boss that's most overlooked. People argue about how the rival should act or what their personality should be like, but take a step back. Why must there be a quote unquote rival in every Pokemon game? It's true that the first games had a brat and every game continues to use or twist that formula, but what is the rival's purpose? They are the recurring boss. They might not be necessary, but this is the boss that grows alongside you, with teams that level up and evolve just like yours. Since you get to meet them multiple times throughout the game, they could have a character arc of their own, while keeping in check that you're leveling up your team, even the new mons you picked up on the way. Personally, I do feel like the term rival has a negative connotation that's more associated with the jerks in the first games. Kinda wish they're just called friends, especially in the recent stories, but eh, that's just a personal gripe. But speaking of story... When I say Pokemon's boss battles, most people think of the gym leaders. See, most mainline stories go like this. There are eight areas with gyms you must conquer and get gym badges from before you are allowed to go down Victory Road and face the Elite Four, which is like a gauntlet of four consecutive gym battles. And then you fight the champion or some story-relevant opponent and hooray! Story's done, most of the time. Unlike the other NPCs, Gym Leaders and the Elite Four are often based around a certain type, as these challenges not only test how experienced your Pokemon are, but they also test your knowledge on type matchups. See, if any Pokemon game is your first game of the franchise, it could be pretty interesting to take notes of which moves are super effective on who. But after two decades of using the similar system, a lot of people already know what the type matchups are. What's worse is that this so-called test on type matchups can be completely overlooked if you're overleveled and KO them in one shot anyways. At their very worst, gym leaders feel like any other NPC encounter just with a fancy sprite or model. Now story and design are essential to these characters and often those are the reasons that carry their popularity, but why not gameplay? It's very rare when a gym leader is recognized to be hard in a casual playthrough, most likely due to how they're at a disadvantage because they have to base their whole team on a particular type. But contrary to what most of these gyms feel like, Pokemon battles aren't always determined off of levels and type matchups alone. You see, there is a notorious gym leader in Generation 2. The third gym was led by Whitney, a normal type specialist. And she has a cow. This mill tank is an infamous difficulty spike because despite not having the highest levels, mill tank has a very optimized stat spread Why is it so and fast? a monstrous moveset with moves that flinch and immobilize you, a signature move that heals themselves, and finally a terrifying move that hits harder and harder after every turn. Now this is a memorable boss fight. Could be a little unfair, but memorable. And that's the thing. While a Pokemon story mode isn't known for being super hard, often yielding people to make their own rule sets and challenges, the competitive scene has a lot of depth. Making a challenge doesn't need to be based purely on levels or using super strong moves because there are strategies and mechanics that can blindside a new player. Hard battles that can teach new players the depths of the game. And I think the developers know that. 
In the most recent games, Game Freak and the Pokemon Company have acknowledged that these gym leaders can at least showcase the generation's gimmick, which becomes essential to the official competitive scene. Alright, but what made me more excited were in the Isle of Armor battles against Avery or Clara, they cheat and cover the playing field with terrains or hazards that most people wouldn't know existed or at least what they did because they are rarely set up by NPCs despite being common in the competitive scene. Even Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, despite being basically a part of the older games, they gave leaders held items and more competitive movesets. One last example here. In the latest Scarlet and Violet, Iono brings out a Ghost Miss Machias, which kinda seems random for an electric gym, but then she turns the Miss Machias into electric type. And whoa. See, electric is only weak to ground types, and Miss Machias levitates above the ground. She essentially made a mon with no weaknesses. To be honest, you could still overlevel yourself, then the whole battle could still be a breeze. But I love this. Do more of these funky strats. Show off how weather can boost certain abilities. Show off what Trick Room does. Show off whatever the pledge moves do. These bosses are an opportunity to teach much more than just tight matchups, and I would love to see future games flex with different strategies, so that the casual gameplay of this two decade long franchise doesn't feel like spamming the same strong move over and over again. It's hard to generalize final bosses, because they're supposed to be surprises. In the earlier games, it was the champion, but Pokemon knows that this would be too predictable, so they mix it up with villain leaders or other story-based NPCs. But usually this final battle takes off the type restriction as you fight a full-fledged team complete with 6 mods. It could be a difficulty spike, but it's perfect for making that ending that climactic. The ultimate test to conclude your journey of this role-playing game. So that about covers most of the trainer battles that can be considered as bosses. I'm sure there are other NPCs and optional post-game challenges, but by now I want to talk about a different kind of boss. Cause what is Pokemon most known for? Their Pokemon. The creature roster is often the highlight of the Pokemon games, or people recognize the Pokemon faster than they recognize a human character from the franchise. Now remember how I mentioned two kinds of battles you usually fight in these games? Trainer battles and wild encounters. Mechanically very similar, but design wise the latter puts a center stage for the creature you encounter with your impressions of it leading you to try catching it instead of knocking it out. So what kind of encounter would feel special? Okay, maybe something with a rare spawn rate like a shiny, but every mon has a shiny. What could the mon itself have to make it feel like a special encounter? Legendary Pokemon are often strong rare Pokemon that you could only have a single copy of in a game. And mythical ones are mostly only available in a certain time window. Some legendaries have a significant role in the story, while others have their own side quests for you to figure out. That's right, because gameplay isn't purely combat, it's also navigating the world and completing puzzles. Pretty neat. But when you do meet that legendary Pokemon, you have to combat it like any other wild encounter. Oh snap! What a legendary battle! Such strong moves! Forget about catching it, we can't even knock it down! We gotta retreat! Oh. You have six whole mons against one. And if you haven't used it yet, you could have a Master Ball which catches it in one throw. Yeah, the combat could be pretty anticlimactic. Now, Pokemon again has improved on this in the recent generations as we see legendaries become more of a formidable threat, despite being alone. They do this by having insane stats and also being uncatchable in your first encounter with them. Now, this is a legendary fight. As you try to juggle your mons around, this beast just one-shots so many of your team. Sometimes to the point that the game has to step in and say that your mons still endure due to your strong friendship. Because numbers wise, yeah, you might be toast. Now hold up, as great as these legendaries are, you do get to have them eventually. That's kind of busted, right? Well, some of these super strong forms are locked behind items or just locked forever, so you only have a reasonably strong mon when you walk into your local tournament. But legendaries aren't the only Pokemon that can give a memorable fight. 
In Generation 7, there were no longer gym leaders, and instead, you had island challenges, which ends with a battle with the totem Pokemon. These aren't special designs, just your run-of-the-mill Pokemon that you could find in the wild, but these totems are bigger, and they have an aura that boosts them. Okay, so a regular Pokemon is a little beefed up. What's so strong about that? Well, these Toda Pokemon can ask for help, where then another Pokemon comes in and you have to start fighting 1v2. You're still playing the same game, but the format is switched up so that you have the disadvantage. You can't catch anyone in this battle, so you have to tough it out and knock him down. It's still possible to overlevel your mons and overwhelm the totems, but at least the additional cutscenes make some of the newly introduced mons shine in the spotlight. It's more accurate to call this section Legends of Arceus as a whole. See, in Pokemon Legends Arceus, not only was there a turn-based component, but also, now your character can dodge roll. Usually in this game, you're expected to partake in both turn-based combat and stealthily hopping around. Instead of having gym leaders, chapters end by encountering a noble Pokemon, which are also newly introduced run-of-the-mill mons that are just larger. But in these battles, you are locked in an arena and have to weave around their attack patterns and throw sand at them before initiating the turn-based portion of the battle. You're still doing the same actions as the rest of the game, but the locked arena and different settings really help make these noble Pokemon and final legendaries stand out more as boss encounters. Also, remember how I mentioned that side legendaries can feel underwhelming, especially if you have a Master Ball? On top of the puzzles and navigations required to meet those legendaries, this time, you don't get a Master Ball anymore, as every legendary has their own 1v1 fight with you, as you have to roll around and pelt them with sandbags. It's certainly an exciting twist to emphasize the rolling mechanic of Legends Arceus. So both Totem and Noble Pokemon replaced the Gym Leaders. Well, in the latest Scarlet and Violet games, we still have Gym Leaders, on top of something called Titan Pokemon, which are newly introduced run-of-the-mill Pokemon that, you guessed it, are big. These Titan battles follow a separate storyline that unlocks mobility mechanics for your Lizard Bite. I don't know if Titan Mons are even buffed, Totems have stat boosts and nobles have arena fights. I just think you need to fight these Titanmons twice in a row. I guess Bombardier had a little bit of dodging in the overworld. But I like how these boss Pokemon can coexist with gym leaders, offering different kinds of challenges. While some bosses might feel more reasonable than others, I really appreciate the variety they can come in in this genre. For my stem based region, I like to have not only characters with their teams, but I also want a few creatures to feel like memorable boss encounters. I'm talking about creatures that would literally get in the way. But instead of requiring a specific item or story beat, these creatures require you to best them. These creatures grow into something giant, something so big that you can't catch them, as you would only find the pre-evolutions in the wild after getting past this giant. So what is this creature I'm talking about? Meet Astro a tiny alien on a nebulous cloud. Nebulae are clouds of gas and dust in space where new stars can be born from. Nebulae usually come from older stars exploding with a supernova, which sends out all sorts of matter throughout space that can later clump up and form new stars. Now, of the stars categorized by astronomers so far, many of these stars fall in the main sequence cluster, like our own sun, which is what Stellic here represents. You know that chart that I just showed? It's called the Hertzsprung-Russell Diagram, which charts stars based off of their surface temperature and luminosity, which is basically their brightness. There are several groups and patterns you can recognize the stars in, but for the final evolution, the one I want to be a boss encounter one day, is a giant. A red giant. When main sequences age, they exit that category in the diagram and can become a giant or even a super giant, depending on how big the star originally was. Red super giants can explode in a supernova, but smaller red giants can just emit layers off until all that's left is a dense white dwarf star, which I tried to reference with Giant Knot's core being their true face. Should I really be thinking about bosses this early on? Eh. I don't think it matters because it is exciting to think about. 
and motivation itself has some value in continuing a project. I know I still got a long road ahead of me. Not gonna make any promises because at the end of the day, I do have a roster of creatures that I'm pretty proud of. But for now, I'll keep fighting for tomorrow. Keep fighting for our next encounter like what all these bosses taught me. Thank you so much for watching till the end. And thank you to my Patreon subscribers. Some of the higher tiers have access to older notes and other sketches. But if you like these kind of videos, you could always subscribe and share the video for free. I have a whole playlist of all these videos that include my stem based mods so far. So once again, thank you for watching and have a great one.